I'm going to get us started with our Code of Ethics panel. Uh, I would just like you guys to ask if you can share in the chat what you think the purposes and goals of advocacy are. So you can add your, your comments in the chat. And so what are the purposes and goals of individual advocacy? The first person I'm going to call on to unmute their mic is Harold. Hi, and good evening all, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, for those people now participating in the panel that have not interacted with me in the past, uh, let me just say that I've been involved in providing individual advocacy for 22 years now, this past January. And, um, try, and I'm very much wedded to the document known as the Code of Ethics that have been previously um, uh, circulated to everybody that I've always used as the basis and orientation for the work I do. But based on that Code of ethic, Ethics, I think it's important to, first of all, talk about uh, what is raised in this question. What is the purpose and goals of the individual advocacy? I think the first thing to understand is if you're going to take on the responsibility to advocate for another person, you realize you need to come to a self-realization of just how important a responsibility you are taking on. You're agreeing to speak for another person, not for yourself. And you need to be able in a position and able to listen and understand what that person's concerns are, what obstacles they are facing, and what you can do to help them enhance their own voice in the community or dealing in with those in positions of authority that are unfairly, unjustly denying them their rights or entitlements. And for me, it's always the cornerstone is that it's easy to lapse in well thinking in terms of I'm representing myself and representing you. No, you can't do that. You are speaking for somebody else and they are trusting you to carry their voice forward. Uh, they may face various obstacles as to why they cannot advocate fully for themselves and they need that kind of support from a person like yourself. It could be lack of education. It could be due to psychological issues. It could be due to, and I've seen this so many times, uh, because of your particular identity, uh, whether it's related to race, uh, sex, sex or sexual orientation, or so many other factors, that they feel an injustice in the system and how they are treated. And they simply have difficulties in overcoming those injustices they face, the unfairness they face, and they need help. But it comes back to them that in that context, you are trying to enhance that person's voice, not to speak for yourself. And I keep, if I sound repetitive, I keep stressing that. And that's what that code of ethics that I work with is centered around. It involves trying to understand the feelings, the, the self-identity that a person brings with them when they first begin to interact with you to, to try and exhibit in every way you can, can your understanding of that situation without creating any false, um, I'll speak honestly here. I, I, there are times in my past I've been guilty when a person tells me that a person of color may tell me their understanding or, or their feelings when they've been victims of racism. And I've, I've had to catch myself and apologize where I say, I understand. No, I don't understand because I've never been able to fit in those shoes. That doesn't mean I should not try to understand and, and work as hard as I can based on that person's identity to try and enhance their voice. But it comes back to I'm doing what I can with the skills, knowledge and experience I've acquired to enhance that person's voice. So what is advocacy? It just comes back to that repetitive point. I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but it's important to stress 
what can you do to empower that person by first of all enhancing their voice and hopefully in the process helping them to find their own voice that they are in a better position that they can learn whether it's the courage the knowledge the experience or simply the understanding they can speak for themselves and and uh, i think over the years that i've done this I've had many successes and I don't have time now to talk about all those details, not just re representing people to ensure they get what they are entitled to, that their rights are respected, but that uh, they also develop a degree of self-confidence that they can learn to take on that role, that they can advocate for themselves successfully against the cruel and oppressive system or systems they face whether it's private or public sector, whether welfare, residential tendencies, labor standards, right across the board. Advocates, land a voice, but always try and strengthen the ability of a person to speak for themselves that they don't need an advocate. So hopefully that's some help in introducing, introducing the subject and let's continue from there. Uh, I really like Harold's um like a point about, about self-advocacy being like ultimately a big a big goal. Um, I think it's really important to emphasize that everyone already has a voice. So sometimes the language we use implies that people don't have a voice, that we are gonna serve as their voice or we're gonna be their voice um, or that we're gonna be the voice for people to, who don't have a voice, but that's, I don't think a great way to put it. Um, Instead, everyone has a voice, but society silences and ignores some voices while listening to others. Um, so as advocates and advocates in training, we need to see ourselves as amplifiers and translators of people's existing voices, um, helping to make the oppressive systems listen and take action. And uh, yeah, I appreciate like some of the things that are happening in the chat here about the word empowerment. So yeah. Um, we should aim to advocate in a way that feels empowering for the people with whom we're working, right? So if someone says, you're not making me feel like I'm very good at stuff, then it means that we have work to do um, in the way that we're doing our ad advocacy work. Yeah. Thank you, Harold and Annie. Um, I just wanna apologize real quick. I'm a little uh, scatterbrained today. And I asked everyone to answer a question in the chat, and then I completely cut everyone off. Um, so I'm just going to read some of the answers that you all provided. Um, you did a really good job. Uh, so we got a few here. Um, advocacy, the purpose of indi uh, individual advocacy is to empower others, uh, to improve quality of life, um, raise, uh, give, well, not give a voice, but to um, empower others to to share their voice and um, help others achieve their goals, providing support. These are all wonderful answers. Um, and the next time I ask everyone to write something in the chat, I'll actually um, wait a few moments and, and let you all do that. Um, so our second question for the panel is, how can we create an advocacy environment that supports trust building and communication? Uh, Harold, if you would like to unmute your mic and start us off. Okay. Um, there's no simple answer as to how to do that in terms of building an environment. It can depend on your own circumstances, your own level of skill, development and knowledge of the system and so on. So I'm not going to pretend that I can tell you this is exactly how you have to do it. But again, I refer back as a starting point and as a standard that, that a code of ethics that we circulated as a set of skills that I think could be important to build on in order to be effective when advocating for others and going back on acting as their voice. Um, I always considered if you're going to take on that kind of role, you set yourself, whether you use the standards I circulate or develop your own, your own very clear 
cut set of ethical standards that you anchor yourself on because that ensures consistency that there are lines that you will not cross uh, that you always recognize first and foremost your own aim is to put your own needs and views aside because you are taking on again that responsibility of acting as the voice for another human being so it can involve uh, you base it on your own personality how you approach a situation the kinds of questions you might ask how you listen uh, there's a wide variety but always anchor yourself on a set of principles that you can be consistent on uh, to the extent that I can claim any success, I rely on others to say whether or not it's good or bad. But for 22 years, I've been in high demand as an advocate. And, and it's always because I acted by those principles. I do not talk down to people. I always treat them as an equal with respect and dignity. And the most important thing is that you always listen to what they have to say and treat what they have to say with respect, that you always treat them with a sense of dignity. Office I work from, we make that a cornerstone, that no disrespect to anybody because of their identity will be tolerated in our office, period. And again, whatever capacity you work in, however you approach the issue, always remember that people in poverty are no better or worse than anybody else, but they deserve the full rights and dignity of everybody else in our society to treat them as human beings. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you, Harold. Um, Carol, did you want to add on to that? Sure. Um, I think advocacy should be person-centered and coming from a genuine place. Um, I also think that it's important for people to know that um, everybody has different experiences that are going to inform their opinions and the way that people think and the decisions that they make. So, um, and th those are often going to be different than the decisions and the thoughts that you might have or the experiences that you have. And um, but those differences need to be respected regardless. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, Luca. Oh, Luca, I believe you're still yeah. muted. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so one version of advocacy is communication. Uh, communication is extremely important. I'm going to share a lived experience, my personal story. Um, I was in an eating disorder treatment program uh, in a facility, and they forced me to eat fish, which is fine, but I broke out in hives. And I told my doctor, and I said, look, it's making me sick. She looked at me and said, that's your eating disorder behavior. You're fine. It's just the eating disorder talking to you. So many years later down the road, I started to eat fish again. And now I have to carry an EpiPen because I am allergic to fish. And my gut instinct at that time was right. Was right. So communication is key. Without communication, we have no community. It is really important to listen and really learn about the people that you are, the people sharing the knowledge and their lived experience, because it could be fatal at the end. You have to believe the people that are talking to you, not just because there is a label attached to whatever it may be. It doesn't mean that their opinions are valid. It doesn't mean or it means their opinions are valid, but it doesn't give the excuse to disrite their concerns. It's a medical decision at that point. So really listen and communicate. Thank you. Thank you for that, Luca. 
Uh, Megan, would you like to unmute your mic and add on? Um, you can create an advocacy environment that supports trust building and communication by using active listening. You can show your actively listening by paraphrasing, paraphrasing what you heard to ensure what you heard and understood is right. You can also ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions open up dialogue and get the conversation going. Feeling listened to helps us build trust. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Annie, I believe it's your turn. I, I really love uh, Megan's point about feeling listened to. Um, and I think like what I would add on to that is that uh, it's important to adapt to the different people and cultures that you're working with. Um, and the best way to figure out what good listening looks like or sounds like for different people is to ask them. Um, some people rely on body language, uh, like nodding or sounds of agreement as well. Um, but others might find that distracting. Um, some people might want eye contact. But others might find that overwhelming. Uh, some people want shared stories, questions, or more of a dialogue, and others may not want any interruptions um, because it makes them lose their train of thought. Uh, and so I think a big part of this work is also just having that conversation and as an advocate, like developing your ability to adapt your communication style um, to the person that you're working with. Um, so that's just something that I thought I would add there. Thank you, Annie. Um, so I have a few follow-up questions based on this question for the panelists. Um, what about uh, building a positive environment uh, in person? How, how does that get done? Uh, Harold, I think that you wanted to say something. Harold, I was just thinking of um, what you've taught me about, you know, like exit routes and how to position chairs and all of that stuff too. I didn't know if you want to share a little bit about that in-person kind of setup. Yeah. Again, and I have to repeat what I said in the first question, there is no simple state forward set of guidelines that I can tell you you have to do it this way. It just comes back to that working from a, from a set of principles or ethics that you can proceed based on your own authority. I can only relate in terms of my own experiences and how I've done it, is that I was always very, very attentive to certain details. Uh, as Annie mentioned, for example, when I set up a first time interview with a new client, uh, the first thing I wanna make sure that I do is that they do not feel like they're boxed in cornered or in any way trapped in my office. I always make a very strong point that there is a door that they can leave any time that they are between me and the door just to establish a comfort level. Uh, that when I start uh, an intake with a new client, I just let the person talk. Far too often people experience the extreme poverty, often compounded by some particular identity issue. Uh, they, in dealing with people in professional capacities, uh, whether it's doctor, lawyer, caseworker at welfare, landlord, whatever, that because of your state of poverty, plus those additional identities, there's a tendency to talk down to you. Be, to behave toward you in a very paternalistic manner, um, to often treat you with contempt or simply being as somebody too, too dumb to understand. So I know how to run your life better than you do. It's to try and ensure you create an environment that nobody will ever feel that way. And again, a skill I use, and this can vary from person to person, is active listening. I shut my mouth and I just let the person talk. I try to use body language as a way, means of encouragement, nodding my head, ensuring I pay attention, um, uh, do not interrupt. And I find the more the person is able to talk, it seems the more confidence they have in saying what they need to say in order for you to get the information you need to be of genuine help to that person. Uh, as I say, they call it active listening, uh, but 
it's if you can't break through that level that the person learns to have confidence in you that you can be of genuine assistance to them you kind of failed right from step one as an advocate so it's over it's overcome that level look at the environment if you're advocating on a regular basis for people is there anything in there that might make a person feel uncomfortable and remove any possible peripheral barrier that might serve as an obstacle to establishing the trust with the person you're trying to help. Many people come to me nervous. Can I really do anything for them? Many times I've had to deal with cases in the end, once I got all the information, I've actually had to tell people, you know, everything you told me, I wish I could, but with the way the rules are, I can't help you. And I even had people ask, thank me just for telling them that because they take the time to explain why what programs like welfare don't do. So at least they understand what situation they are. That's where you then get into the field of collective advocacy, what we're not talking today about today, that you need to find ways to change the system based on what you and others gain as information. But it comes back to first and foremost, a comfort level. And again, that can be geared to your own personality. But don't ever, ever say, uh, and I mentioned that in question two, that you know what you don't know. Don't, excuse my language, bullshit people in order to gain that confidence. Always approach it with honesty and openness. Uh, I do a whole course uh, where I have a whole module on this subject. Uh, so we have very limited time here, but hopefully this opens the door, open the door to that kind of discussion. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Harold. Um, would any of the panelists like to speak to how trust can be built either by communicating on phone or online? Uh, I have something that I want to add to that, but uh, I, I just want to invite Luca maybe to share about um, the importance of like um, name tags or like signs in, in a physical space or even not like say like me in my video space here what what could I have done to my environment that would have made you feel more comfortable or like that I maybe had some of some shared values and stuff with you Luca thank you Annie uh so as at the beginning of every zoom workshop I have kindly asked people to put their pronouns I don't know if people have noticed that but the reason behind that is so it's everybody is included, including those who don't identify as she or he. There are people that identify that are they, them, he, him. Uh, so it's just a, out of respect for the LGBTQ plus community and trans folks, especially and non-binary. So it's just a, it's a way of showing that you're standing with them and that everybody's equal within a room. Um, so even in some ways you can also show that expression of showing your pronoun at, you know, like a letter cover, uh, just anything formal. So like on our Zoom call, we have our pronouns now. Um, we are trying really hard to get HSC uh, nursing students to have pronouns on their tags. And that might indicate for, um, you know, a, what do you call it? Not a customer, um, a patient. So if you have a patient coming in and you want to assume their gender or they don't want to assume your gender tag and they'll be able to respect that. And that will open up a line of communication as well. So it's out of respect and communication at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Luca. Yeah, I've, I've also learned from Luca and other folks in PACA how reassuring it can be to walk into a space and to see, um, for example, uh, the, the triangle with the rainbow or to, um, yeah, to have a poster that shares uh, abolition um, perspectives. Um, it kind of like lets people know that you share some of the values. Luca, you have something to add? I do. 
Uh, <laughs> within that, as much as I love an opportunity to see a little rainbow on a nursing staff's tag, that also creates a lot of responsibility. So you can't claim to be an ally by having a rainbow on your tag. You have to have the backup knowledge to be able to resource the uh, patient to whatever resources they may need at that time. So just by, even if we have like the pronouns and then your rainbow tag or the triangle or whatever you want to, I think there might be some connectivity. To represent. That's a, also another line of communication that you. Ooh. It's okay, Luca, keep going. I think it's freezing, but it's catching up when it gets connected again. Can you hear me? Uh, so just by just acknowledging that if you do wear a rainbow symbol and you're non LGBTQ. Plus, please have the reason why it's just invalidating at that point. Yeah, that's uh, such a great point. And Angela wrote that also in the chat. That's really good insight because um, we don't want to be superficially uh, claiming that we know things. And so, in fact, before you display something, before you have a sign up, before you start like putting pronouns in your name tag, um, do the homework, right? Uh, gather the network of resources, do the homework of reading up on the topic, similar to the homework we asked you to do last week. Um, so that if someone actually says, oh, great, like this person um, is representing their value publicly and for their values publicly, you have something to, to share with that. Um, in terms of online, I think that some of this translates, not a, a ton of it translates, but it, some of it does. And I think, I, I don't know the new kind of um, best practices around this yet. Maybe other people do and, and people will be able to share. Um, but I think the, the kind of thing that I would reiterate is to be in good communication with the person and ask them what makes them feel um, safest and most heard online. And what I've heard is a variety of practices. So in some practices, it said, um, if you have regular meetings with someone that, and um, it helps them to have a video on meeting where they have to prepare for the day and it gives them a routine. Um, and that's something they appreciate because that's actually a good practice. I've also heard that for some people um, that stops them for, from engaging in advocacy meetings or, or counseling or you know, different opportunities. And so, if it helps them to get to the meeting by not having the video on, then that's a good practice. Um, I've also heard about like a, kind of an in-between that um, the, ad, the advocate and the, and the person seeking advocacy agree that they don't want, that what makes them uncomfortable is like staring into the camera. So they just angle their computer away and they like camera on, you can kind of still see the person, but it's not quite like that intensive experience. I've also heard about experience of people just wanting to know folks are in the room and so they just angle it down. It's just not even showing their face. So kind of, those are all like examples, but um, just to, to say that there's no perfect way as, as Harold was saying, and to, to talk to the person and figure out something that works for people where they feel like um, that they're being listened to and that they can be comfortable. Um, and something that Harold pointed out that I thought was really good was, like most folks who are low income and seeking advocacy related to poverty probably don't have um, the access to internet um, and computers that would mean that they would do, be doing video calls anyway. So there's actually a lot of work that has to be done like trust building over the phone as well. And, and most, most things will happen in person is what Harold was sharing um, as well. So um, we're gonna, I don't know if anyone else has, has ideas if, if you've done any amount of online trust building work. Communication in the chat, just so if you don't have your 
video on as long as you're making little chat waves just to know that you're present and it helps the facilitator know that you're actively listening without being on camera. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Way. Yeah, and there's like, you can also have it, it doesn't have to be equal, right? So maybe the advocate um, is willing to keep their camera on, that way the person can see them actively listening. Um, but maybe the other person who's like sharing and um, seeking advocacy doesn't doesn't have to as well. And the reactions and the in the chat, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Elle was talking about uh, you need to be able to walk the walk, not just talk the talk when it comes to like displaying your values. Yeah, yeah. I think that's it for me, Mackenzie. All right, thank you, Annie, and thank you, Luca. Um, is there anything else that the panelists would like to add um, with regards to how to create an advocacy environment that supports trust building and communication? I do. Um, confidentiality is really important. And that's not just uh, maintaining that privacy between the two parties, I guess the advocate and the person that being advocated for, but that also carries through in other environments, like say with your coworkers or when you're discussing things with other service providers, you always wanna make sure that you're being respectful and that you're not um, being disrespectful or you know coming across that way. Awesome, thank you, Carol. I have no experience with that, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, so this is one of those times where I'm supposed to ask you all to write something in the chat and actually wait. Um, so if you wouldn't mind sharing a practice that you'd like to use or something that hasn't already been mentioned that you want the group to think about uh, with regards to creating um, a safe space for communication and trust building. Um, making sure that the individual feels in control and that um, they, they're in the lead of the interaction. It's not something that you, you force on them, um, respecting people's boundaries, um, not pushing them to talk about the things that make them uncomfortable. Um, discussing the boundaries beforehand is also really good. Um, active listening. Um, asking is always better than assuming. Um, yeah, and letting the, the individual know that you're there to help them and that they're, they're in charge of, of what's going on. These are all some really good answers. I want to be able to read all of them, but there are so many. <laughs> we'll, we'll save the chat and we'll, we'll put it in the meeting materials folder. Oh, there we go. Just, right. just add very quickly, one way I describe the service we work to provide over the years is we describe ourselves as client driven. We do not make decisions for you. We may advise you, may assist you in any way we can, but you make the decisions, not us, that you're in control of the agenda. Thank you, Harold. Yeah, the importance of of letting the person be in charge of their decisions. Um, so our third and final question for the panel, what are good practices that support inclusive language and your ability to adapt to people with lived experience? Carol, would you like to um, add your response? So what you say is probably, or pardon me, how you say something is going to be just as important as what you're saying. So that's like the tone that you're using, the cadence, the speed, the language. Um, you wanna make sure that how you're talking is appropriate for the person that you're talking with and it makes them feel comfortable um, and that they feel respected and can understand you. Uh, you should pay attention so that you could adapt and reflect the person's body language, their vocabulary, way of listening and speaking, et cetera. Yeah, I really, um, again, like 
agree with Carol. I had to do a lot of learning in this area. And something that sticks out to me is using specific and self-identified names. So like mirroring people's like vocabulary for themselves. Um, for example, um, using Anishinaabe instead of indigenous, once someone has told you that they are Anishinaabe. Um, uh, I also think it's important to avoid paternalist or possessive language. So you might hear people say things like our indigenous peoples or our women um, and othering language like those communities, these people, them. Um, and the, I think the simple fix for that is just to replace our with the and to replace the othering language like these, those um, with more specific language. So for example, instead of saying these communities, you could say urban indigenous communities or the 2S LGBTQ plus community. Um, yeah. Luca, did you? Oh, you already said, I think, the about the pronouns and gender neutral terms, but did you have anything more to say about that? I think um, another part is having a content warning and really getting the feel of the room. Uh, so if you're going into a room and like, so I'm facilitating, when I go into a room, I wanna check out the room and make sure everybody is on board with the conversations that may take hand. I always put a warning before my content because I don't wanna put people through those experiences that have been through those experiences and we don't need to remind people of their own experiences all the time. So I always put a trigger warning and I always get the feel of the room before I start a conversation. So if I feel the room isn't ready for that conversation, I'll decline out of respect for myself and those involved. Thanks. Thank you for that, Luca. Uh, Megan, I believe you wanted to share something. Um, avoid ableist language like crazy, insane, blind, or lame, and use people first language like persons with disability. Mm -hmm. I like this like as a good practice as well, because I think it applies to like more than um, the disability community. Um, so for example, uh, we can talk about people who use substances instead of using the word addict. Um, we can talk about people who are unhoused or experiencing houselessness or homelessness instead of saying homeless people or even worse, uh, like even more dehumanizing the homeless. Um, so I feel like that's a really good one, Megan. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Luca? Uh, just quickly uh, for when talking with a person who lives with mental illness, they aren't the mental illness, they live with it. It's not them. You wouldn't say you're cancer or why is it okay to say you're schizophrenic? No, they live with the illness. They are not their own illness. Thanks. Thank you, Luca. Carol? I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, sorry, I just wanted to know if you had something to add um, just about um, what good practices are that support inclusive language? Um, it's going to differ from person to person. Um, different people have different opinions and preferences. And if you don't feel comfortable asking, maybe you should just try to pay attention to the words and the language that they're using for themselves and um, try that and see if it works. I keep double doubling down on people's <laughs> people's comments, but this is I agree with Carol so much about this. Um, and an important consideration, though, like when you're using this practice, is you have to know about the history of the word, um, and how the word has been used by different people in history. So, for example, um, people are probably like I I've, I've had a couple conversations with people now about like words referring to indigenous communities. But even if an Indigenous person refers to themselves as Indian or Indian, um, it's still not a good idea for a non-Indigenous person to use that term to refer to someone who is Indigenous or just misuse it at all. 
Um, this also applies to triggering words like the N-word. And sometimes it's not clear whether to use the person's self-identified term or not, because maybe you just don't know that history yet. So the refrain is, it's good to check with the person, right? So just ask them. Um, and they might just like, they might tease you, they might give you a little like a lecture, they might be okay with it. Um, one example I'll share is uh, we had an experience in one of the community organizing groups that I'm part of where someone um, used the word crip to refer to themselves. Um, and they preferred that we also use that reclaimed term to refer to them in their bio. Um, but that was like a mutual agreement um, and a conversation. Uh, but as myself, someone who is not disabled, um, I wouldn't just randomly assume that someone with a disability would be okay with being um, referred to as crip. That's like a particular choice that people make. And if they self-identify and like give you that permission, um, I think that's like a conversation to have. Um, Luca, I think you were gonna share a little tip on uh, how to recover when you make mistakes, because we're all gonna make mistakes. Yes. So if you make a mistake, you can apologize and correct yourself. The best apology is changed behavior. Yeah. And one of the things that Luca and I talked about in preparing for this panel was like how awkward it is when someone makes a mistake and then they make it all about them. So someone like misgenders someone or someone says something that's like a slur and then they like, they're like, oh, I feel so bad. I'm so sorry. I feel so bad. Oh no, Luca, I'm so sorry. And then Luca ironically has to then comfort the person instead of accepting an apology and then moving on watching the person learn from the experience, right? And so I think um, acknowledge the mistake, apologize, change your behavior and that will be the best like demonstration that you've learned from the experience and Luca did not suffer or whoever it is like the person who experiences racism did not suffer or whatever for no reason that you've learned um, from that encounter with that person. Okay. Mackenzie, I'll hand it back to you. All right, so thank you um, to all of our lived experience experts for sharing for this panel.